I just want to welcome you to AJA Lunchtime Live. I'm Kimberly Carroll. I am the director of Animal Justice Academy. And welcome to all you beautiful people here who are joining us live. I appreciate you so much joining us live. And for those of you who weren't able to join us live, I'm so glad that you're taking the time to watch the replay. Welcome. Today, our topic is bringing animal advocacy into schools. And we have joining us uh, uh, an AJ or Ayer himself, um, who has been doing fabulous things, Mike Farley. And whether you're an educator, whether you have kids in your life, or you just recognize that kids in school right now will be deciding our future society, um, incorporating animal protection into school communities is such an important topic. So Mike, welcome, Mike Farley. Hey, thank you. So <laughs> much I, oh. I you know being a teacher I, I never really have a chance to to do the lunchtime live session so this exactly. is the only way I could actually do it is just like appear on one so yeah exactly so I make I, I make you come on it too <laughs> That's right. That's and right. we're already up to almost 50 people Mike Amazing. so obviously Amazing. a bunch of teachers have either ended their um uh ended their year or they're sneaking out for a little yeah. uh, a little uh lunchtime live action um Mike I just want to give folks just a little bit of back more background on you okay um just so that they know all you've been involved with so Mike has been um teaching middle and high school School geography and environmental studies for 20 years in um, Toronto. He's also a sessional lecturer for the University of Toronto's Master of Teaching program, and he's a member of the Institute for Humane Education faculty at Antioch University. Um, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Antioch. Okay, just wanted yeah. to check. I was like, that didn't sound right for some reason. Um, besides um, founding and organizing the annual Educators for Animals Conference, which we're, which we're going to talk about very shortly, Mike is a frequent presenter at education conferences in Canada and the US on topics such as human rights, environmental issues, and animal protection. Mike, the first thing I have to say is happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> A little bird. Thank My you. partner, yeah. Matt, who sees everybody on Facebook said, it's Mike's birthday. It was yesterday or the day before? It was uh, the day before. The yeah, day before. Ago, okay. yeah. I thought you were going to say um, it was back in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you were eight months late. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No. No. Uh, well, happy birthday. I thank hope you. you get to celebrate in fine form this week. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so um, Mike, let's take it back um, to the beginning of this spark of idea called Educators for Animals. Um, what inspired you? What inspired to this in initiative to start with? Well, I mean, AJA was a huge inspiration. Mm -hmm. that, that was, it was around that time that it was just getting kicked off. And I was also doing my MED in humane education at the same time. And I was trying to figure out what my next step was going to be, you know, as an educator. And I was becoming really, really passionate about animal advocacy, animal issues. I was thinking, how, how can I work as an educator within that sphere of influence that I have? What can I do to leverage my position to, to help raise awareness about, about animals? And it was, it was literally, it was, I, was, I was struggling with that, trying to figure it out. And then AJA came along. I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe how many people were coming together um, all of these different um, backgrounds and professions and I was just so inspired by that and and that really was I just saw the power of community and what that could do sharing ideas um, and how many people were interested in it so that's really where things started and and then as a result that I started reaching out to other educators across Canada it was just it just started out with a few zoom calls here and there and then it just snowballed into um, I mean, I was every day I was just speaking to, to more and more educators and then it went around the world speaking to people. And, and so then there was just like a, a kind of like a, a backdrop that was carrying me along um, where there was just such a, an interest in, in doing more work in this area. Mm, yes. Yeah. And I remember it happening. I remember sort of there was a few connections here and then there was a, like, yeah. it was so organic. It was just yeah. like, as soon as you came on to one of the panels, I think, and spoke, there was a, a lot of people, there were a lot of people, because I think it was a panel we were talking about yeah. taking activism into your own communities, wherever you were. And you were somebody that we talked, you know, had cut talking about how you bring it into your own classrooms. And over the years, you've tried to incorporate it into your own school. And, um, and then you had all, like this reaction of of people of other teachers other educators going 
I want to do this. Yeah. And so there's this groundswell that you just sort of rode. That was, it was great. And, and yeah, so tell us about like last, the first inaugural conference was incredible at 600 people. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about it. Yeah. So it, it originally, it was going to be, my goal is a hundred people, hundred Canadian educators. Uh, it was going to be really small and then word got out and people started contacting me from all over the place. Then we just opened it up and then it was over 600 people. We had like over, I think we had 25 sessions in total, 50 speakers. Um, it just really, I mean, it just surpassed in any, any kind of conceivable idea I had about this. It just kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, and it really, I think for a lot of people kind of kickstarted something in their own practice, but then also as a community of educators, um, you know, that we could actually work together and help each other and support each other and, and really help to, you know, bring more awareness to, um, how schools are, are advocating for animals, but then also how we're also engaging in the exploitation of animals. Um, through a number of areas, like through food or through animals as, as learning tools on field trips, uh, whether, you know, how they're portrayed in the curriculum or not even uh, talked about. So all of these different areas, that's really what the conference was digging into is how do we, how do we um, work um, in those various areas to, to inspire people? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and so let's talk about, I mean, I sort of alluded to it in my intro. Um, wh- why is teaching compassion for animals to kid, you know, with kids so key, was so key to yeah. them and to, to our world? Yeah, I, I, I know maybe some of you saw there was this recent study that came out of Exeter and Oxford in the UK. And they, they, their research found that speciesism really took root in, in adolescence, that up until adolescence, speciesism was, was much less or, or non-existent, but then over time and through different messages and, and cultural messages, societal messages, that that was a learned thing. So from what my own experience was, I, I really didn't wake up to speciesism until a few years ago. And so I'd spent decades and decades and decades mired in that. Um, and now for me, it's just this ongoing journey of trying to unpack that and trying to do what I can to extricate myself from that and work towards, you know, working against that. But I thought, well, what, why should we wait you know, decades for people? Why don't, we, why don't we address this at an early age when students, um, you know, especially elementary school kids, high school kids, pre-K, they, they're already... Um, ripe for kind of wanting to to not delve into this or not want to go down that route of speciesism. So, um, you know, and, and then at the same time, we see that schools are, are helping to perpetuate speciesism, like for all those reasons I was just mentioning. So we're, you know, on the one hand, we're te- teaching about, you know, compassion and empathy. Those are big messages. And, and those are things we're trying to do in education. But we're also exploiting animals, you know, directly in our schools, but then also perpetuating ideas about speciesism that is furthering contributing these problems. So that's why I think it's so critical, you know, that that we should be doing this in schools, you know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There there yeah. is that window um, yeah. before um, people get indoctrinated basically with speciesism. And, um, and I know Eleanor who's here, Eleanor Carrera, she's working on the university level, which, you know, still minds are still pretty open in the university. They're, they're, they're quite, you know, uh, adaptable and, 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 and willing to try new things. But you're, you know, when we're dealing even younger, we're dealing with minds that are still being formed, you know, yeah. and I think you talk to most kids, uh, you know, below the age of, I don't know, eight, and you say, hey, do you know that hot dog you're eating is a piggy? And they're, they're horrified, you know, like not the piggy I see, you know, and, um, and so I know it's, it's kids don't have this natural instinct to want to hurt animals. Um, and so, um, or to even ignore their plight. So to be able to say, there is another way, you know, to, to have their eyes open and not, you know, have their sort of very natural instincts and concerns brushed under the bed, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. 
Mm. So, um, Mike, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you're seeing educators incorporating, incorporating animal advocacy into classes and into school communities? I mean, you have probably heard so many yeah. stories or, or dealt with so many different educators. So give us give us a few ideas. Yeah, so seeing. I thought I would share my screen here. If that's yeah, okay. please do. Yeah, so I mean, this this is the conference website, the Educators for Animals conference website, and I just wanted to 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 highlight some of just to give people an idea of some of the sessions that are being offered. So, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, we have just an unbelievable uh, lineup of keynote speakers. We have Dr. Aisha Akhtar, who's looking mm -hmm. at replacing animals in science and research. Genesis Butler, who's an incredible student animal activist in California, working against dissection, but also promoting um, uh, sanctuaries and the links between climate change and racial justice. And then Dr. Carl Safina, who has written a lot, a number of best-selling books and is looking at animal sentience and culture. So mm -hmm. we have a great um, group of keynote sessions. But then if you look at our regular sessions, you know, so for example, um, we have uh, people who are working at the post-secondary level who are doing deep, deep research into um, uh, uh, speciesism. Um, we have, uh, this is um, Jasmine Ferrer, who's at York University, who's looking at um, anthropocentrism in social work. Um, we have Jane G from Spring Ray Studio. She's created video games that are promoting uh, meatless uh, lunches and promoting um, uh, celebration of animals. Um, we have uh, Posado's uh, Sanctuary Safe Haven in Seattle, outside Seattle. They're looking at uh, sanctuary field trips. Mm. Um, we have Serene Slabert from British Columbia. Uh, she and her partner have created an app that is like a virtual hatching app. So you don't have to do hatching in the classroom, okay. uh, egg hatching or, or chicken hatching in the classroom. Research done on zoos and aquaria and the problems with those types of field trips. Mm. Um, we have the connection, like a comprehensive humane ed uh, approach, looking at the links between uh, human rights, uh, environmental ethics, and animal protection. Um, we have the Free Kiska Social Justice Project. That's um, yeah. from Lily Castrioitis, I believe, and um, Judith Goldberg, who's a principal in the York region. So they're mm -hmm. looking at freeing Kiska from marine land. Yeah, uh, love Judith. Animals. Yeah, I mean, this the, you get a sense. You just uh -huh. get a sense. As you, this is really exciting for me as I'm putting the conference together. Yeah. I'm looking at all of these incredible sessions. Um, yeah. Valerie True from University of Guelph. She's the director of the Early Childhood Learning Center there. She's looking at social justice and plant-based uh, child care centers. Um, opting out of uh, a dissection as animal learn in the United States. The Humane Education um, uh, Wing from the Calgary Humane Society. They're going to be uh, doing a uh -huh. session on the, all the work that they've done over the last hundred years. So there's a, the yeah. Humane Society is regularly going into school classrooms yeah. in Calgary and doing doing stuff. I and I, and yeah. that, I haven't actually heard of that yeah. anywhere else. <laughs> Interestingly, you think that yeah. would be a, a, a natural for Humane Societies? Interesting. So yeah, I hope I'm anybody related to now. Humane Societies is listening yeah. up to this. Yeah. 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 So I. I I just, that's kind of a, a, a little mm -hmm. peek at, um, you know, some of the sessions that are on tap, but also gives you kind of a lay of the land of the work that's being done at, in so many different ways. So, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. yeah, so just unpacking a couple of those, like I know Judith um, Goldberg, yeah. um, who I've worked with in the past, she, um, so their project has been to get uh, classrooms in her school to actively lobby politicians, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So you have you have students who are writing letters, doing campaigns, um, getting other grades involved. So Lily is a kindergarten teacher herself, but they've gotten the whole school involved. And I think it's it's really interesting to have Judith as a as a principal. Mm -hmm. you know, usually, it's, usually we don't find people working at the admin level in schools getting involved with this, or at least that's been my experience. So yeah, yeah. Um, that adds a whole different um, layer and weight to, to a campaign like that. And, and I think they've had a lot of success in, in raising awareness. And I think it's something when it comes from students that are that young, 
that are advocating from kindergarten students or elementary students. It's like, wow, like they're asking adults to pay attention to this and do something. Yeah, you yeah. can't, you can't turn your, your eye to that or you can't, you can't turn away from that. So yeah, it's the Greta yeah. effect, right? Yeah, I mean. exactly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I remember um, when Nathaniel Erskine Smith was last on um, and we were grilling him just about getting in touch with MPs and, you know, email versus calls versus right. snail mail. And he said, Oh no, absolutely no snail mail. Nobody wants that anymore. And he said, unless, Less, they're from kids. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only exception. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see uh, that. Well, that's amazing. Um, so, um, you know, Mike, uh, uh, you have had a lot of education, uh, a lot of background in humane education. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, need to be kept in mind when bringing animal advocacy right. to kids in school? I mean, particular, I'm talking particular strategies or yeah. what, around different age groups. Like, how, what are some of the things through your education you picked up? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I, I'm not, so, it's really, yeah, it's a, I mean, you studied this for how many years? Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I know there's a lot of, I just want to say there's a lot of educators have been working a lot longer at this than I have. So I don't want to kind of package this as a new thing. There's so many people um, who've been doing some great work and we're standing on the shoulders of so many folks. But, but some of the things I've learned, like one thing that I've been trying to lean into more and more is that I don't, you know, I don't know if there's really any villains in all of this, you know, and I think a lot of times it can be couched as that, especially in education. It's like there's these evil people doing whatever that is. Um, but really trying to um, talk to students about this in a way, talking about like we're working in really complex, long-standing dysfunctional systems. You know, in this case, it happens to be around animals and the exploitation of animals. But these are these are really complex systems that have evolved over a long period of time, and and they're they're difficult. We're to all dismantle. caught in. We're all Everyone, caught in. The we're farmers part are caught that. in. The CEOs, everybody's caught in this system. Edu educators are. I am. You are. We're mm. all part of this, and we're all trying to. Well, we're, there there are people who are trying to figure out what to do, and so it it takes away kind of that charge. I think of like it's it's us versus them, or that you know that we've realized we're all part of this. We're all kind of acting in it and being affected by it in different ways. You know that's definitely true. And to different degrees for sure but but if we look at it from a systems approach then that that has been really interesting for the students i think mm -hmm. also you know coupled with that is like age appropriate um uh activities ways of looking at things so for you know i just did a project with my grade sevens where it was very kind of love approach you know a, a celebration of animals loving animals there was no graphic imagery in any way um the students in the end they had to design an animal sanctuary anywhere in the world so they had to research an animal that was that was being threatened in some way mm -hmm. and they had to look at what are the needs of that animal if you're going to create a sanctuary and and they they just it was just amazing we did a virtual sanctuary field trip to Posados and also to um toucan rescue ranch in costa rica mm -hmm. and that that just kind of um uh uh, really fostered this this increased love for animals and care for those animals and then that kind of came out through the project when they were designing these sanctuaries where if you're looking you know working with students who are maybe in high school or post-secondary you can maybe get into some of the more serious aspects of how exactly animals are being exploited and um, kind of the the horrific aspects of that and and maybe what we need to do about that so you know there, there's there's different approaches and then and I think also you know, my own training through the Institute for Humane Education is comprehensive humane education. So the lens is always going to be um, looking at how human rights, environmental ethics, and animal protection are intertwined and enmeshed in one another. And usually when you're looking at, you know, you know one issue, if you look at climate change, for example, you say, well, that's an environmental issue. So you know, actually, no, it's directly linked to the exploitation of animals. It's linked to racial justice. It's linked to all of these other issues. And so how can we not silo these issues and look at actually how they're affecting, you know, really all parts of, of the planet, you know, humans, non-human animals, uh, the rest of the natural world, et cetera.
Right, so sort of um, parallel to uh, the the movement in politics of the One Health movement, you yeah, know, bringing all these right. these exactly. um, interlinking factors together. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, you know, Mike, what? Uh, so, you know, just so that people have ideas of of some of the different types of things that say teachers have tried in the schools um, that have tried to bring into in the classrooms um, you so I love your sanctuary idea and especially as yeah. a geography environmental teacher that's brilliant um, any other things that kind of stick out to you that you've sort of heard of from colleagues that they've brought into the classroom that really worked well um, yeah I'm just trying to think of uh, you know I know for example there's a teacher at my school she teaches economics Mm -hmm. And so this is how senior students. So she did a whole activity. She had a guest speaker come virtually about looking at the, the rise of plant-based meat, the rise of cultivated meat, but mm -hmm. from an economics perspective, you know, ah, which is really interesting. interesting. So I'm not, I'm not sure if the animal kind of ethics piece really entered into that, but it was yeah. looking at like externalities and all of these economic concepts, which mm -hmm. I don't really understand, but um, you know, she really took uh, an interesting approach to that. Um, I know there's um, uh, Amanda Garner from, from the United States. She's going to be speaking at the conference as well. So she does a lot of work. She's a science teacher, bio teacher. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of this kind of backyard bio work where she's taking the students. They, they, it's more of a kind of a rural campus, but they actually just go outside for a lot of their classes. Um, they go and study the wildlife that are uh, in the air. So if that's something that's available to teachers, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, there's the campaigns like um, Judith and Lily um, are, are undertaking. Yeah. Um, you know, there's uh, Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat Your Pants, who he'd run this recent global bio fest, which I know AJ had promoted, but uh, they do virtual field trips and have uh, guest speakers come to the classroom on mm -hmm any number of issues. They tend to be more focused on the conservation of wildlife, but mm -hmm. you know, that's another important aspect. So sure. um, absolutely. I mean, really it's just, you name it, there's teachers mm -hmm. who are working in that space, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are, uh, you know, Kathy Benjamin, who is an AJ, or I don't yeah. think she's here today because she's probably yeah. in the classroom, but she uh, teaches special ed and she's been doing a course in special ed around the, yeah. you know, environmental health and, um, eth you know, ethical uh, concerns around animals. And it's, you yeah. know, in her, in her own way, knowing uh, how, how to communicate um, and best strategize with, with teaching, you know, um, uh, in special ed, she's managed to, you know, really bring um, you know, this topic into this classroom and, and change some hearts and minds there. So yeah, I know Kathy and like Brandy Humes from TDSB, they're both in TSB. They were also, they also teach family studies and, and cooking classes. And so yes, I know Kathy's exactly. doing the whole baking yeah. thing around vegan baking. And that's I know right. Brandy has been doing a lot of work with vegetarian, vegan cooking with her. So mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, yeah. again, it's pretty well, it. like anywhere, like, it's kind of like if you're doing any sort of, um, uh, master's or PhD thesis. I mean, you can find a way within your arena to right. explore something in terms of animals. You know, I've, I've seen some very creative ways of bringing animals into the equation. So, um, yeah. but Mike, you know, how hard is it for educators to bring animal advocacy into the school, their schools and in their classrooms? Like what are, what are the biggest challenges that you see come up for them? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a few, I think, I think, the one that first comes to mind is usually the first thing when I speak to people about is like this idea of pushback, you know, and that pushback comes from students, come from parents, other teachers, administrators, you know, you name it. But, but that, I think that can happen. Um, I've been fortunate to have had very little of that in my career, but I do know that's a reality. I mean, depending where you are, what context you're teaching, what age you're teaching, what community you're teaching in. Um, so that's something to be aware of. I, I have found personally with pushback, though, is that teachers who I've spoken to are very fearful of pushback and then kind of dipped their big toe in the water and tried mm -hmm. something. A lot of the time it was unfounded, their fears. You know, they were mm -hmm. really super worried. I been super worried. And then you try something. It's like, oh, like all of a sudden, all these people start to emerge who are really they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm really a passionate about animals, too, within your school, amongst your students, the mm -hmm. parents. 
Um, so, so that, but that's definitely something to consider. You really have to know your, your school community, again, whether that's mm -hmm. pre-K to post-secondary, you have to know kind of who you're working with and you have to kind of be appropriate and, and aware and empathetic, you know, whatever environment you're working in. Mm -hmm. And and, you're, then, and, and the yeah, key yeah. thing you said there was yeah. dip your toe in, try dip something in, small, try yeah. you know, just try something small. That's not too, doesn't feel too scary and, yeah. and see what happens and you'll get bolder as you go. I know there was, uh, I think it's um, John Graber. I think John Graber, TDSB teacher. So he, he's a math teacher and he started on test, like he would give a test and he's, he would give a math problem. And it, was a, and it would be like, Mr. Graber is having a, a barbecue and is serving veggie, you know, hot dogs or whatever. And then, but it was his math problem. But he, that's the way he started, you know, he just started. And then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden great. after it's like, oh, what's a, what's a veggie dog? And then that would open up a whole conversation. But he was like kind of these little ways of doing it. And then that it's like, oh, wow, this guy didn't fall. And now he's doing amazing work. So, um, I mean, it's, it's yeah. in simple things like yeah. that teachers have influence and, in, you know, yeah. re when they refer to an animal as they, as opposed to it, right. um, right. you know, or that, I mean, that's, that goes for any of us in any community. Um, if we can start speaking of animals, not as property, but as individuals, yeah. um, then that, that can at least, it, it at least starts a conversation because people go, what yeah. they, what, like, yeah, or, exactly. You know, yeah. Perfect. Um, so, um, and uh, I, I'm just going to read a little co comment yeah. from M. Jones because they said, I use short stories and poems to teach and prompt discussion regarding empathy for animals. I sponsor pigs at a local sanctuary and have done a fair amount of public activism, which has prompted several students to become vegan over the years. However, I still meet with a lot of resistance from colleagues. So would you say it's colleagues that might be the biggest pushback? I think in speaking to people, that hasn't been my experience. Okay. okay. Again, I'm very, very fortunate, but but I have heard from other educators that I think that's probably the number one area. Yeah. It's not the, the students. Usually, the students are great, yeah. um, uh, but I have heard that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it it just boggles my mind. I I wonder how much push back they get in classrooms when they teach the Dairy Farmers of Canada curriculum, which right. is distributed to all schools. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've heard that, you know, talking about kind of some of the limiting factors is sometimes there'll be a presentation from dairy farmers of Ontario, Canada, whatever. And, and a teacher is like, oh, no, you have to do this. Again, it depends on the school you're at, but that's, that's a dilemma. You know, that's a dilemma mm -hmm. to face. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I am going to, we are opening this up to questions. Yeah. Um, I have lots for Mike, but uh, I wanted to um, also just say if you folks have questions, I have noted the ones that have been asked already, but just to help us um, do uh, uh, delineate the questions, do star, 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 Q, um, and, which Tenebrae just did. And I'm going to ask this question of you, Mike, um, what to do with student pushback? Do you have any any advice on that, Mike? Yeah, it's it's a it's a delicate thing. I mean, ideally, ideally, you can help avoid some of that, or you can try to avoid some of that by really getting to know your students as much as possible. You know, starting small and kind of building and seeing where the students are at, getting a temperature of the students. But you never know. You never know. And I mean, I I have had some pushback from students and. You, you just have to respect students where they're at without just kind of giving in or not engaging in the discussion to begin with. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, especially with younger students, you have to realize that a lot of them um, are maybe those uh, uh, ideas or that information is coming from other sources, like maybe from parents or from a celebrity or what have you. And so, uh, you try and unpack that with them. It's like, okay, where, where is this idea coming from? Or, you know, there's kind of gentle ways to do that, which, which teachers are, are usually really good at, at doing. So, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and it really is, you know, if, if something is coming up, there's, there's usually, you know, something yeah. behind it. It's, it's a, an idea of uh, not wanting to betray somebody or not wanting yeah. to seem strange or, you know, so yeah. there's often so much more behind that. And you're right, Mike, the more sort of, you know, your students, the better you can deal with what's really, what's underlying it. Um, I, I just have to say quick too, I've seen, those are the students where you, sometimes you see the most dramatic changes, you know, yes. you get to the end of the project, for example, the sanctuary project, students who are, who were 
definitely not on board at the beginning. And by the end of it, there's been some quite, you know, like the person in the, in the chat just said, then they over years became vegan or whatever became more interested in. A lot of times with the students who had the most pushback at the beginning, you see the most dramatic changes. So I had that experience, you know, this spring, which was really uh, inspiring. Yeah. Mm, um, yeah. Khalil, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure I yeah. got it. Um, Khalil is asking, what exactly are some of the pushbacks you're referring to? So, um, yeah, you yeah. like you're you go ahead, Mike. You know better yeah. than I. Do. I mean, I know, I know. Um, uh, you know, for example, there was somebody in AJ and Kimberly. I can't remember who it was, but there was a teacher in British Columbia, and her school. As a fundraiser, they were selling chickens. They were selling the whole chickens. That's I think. right. That's I right. can't remember who it was, but but she she was like, hey, she wanted to bring up with I think it was maybe it was the parents association or the teachers that were doing that, and so it was difficult. And I think in the end they went ahead with that fundraiser because they would raise a lot of money doing no, it. No, they actually they didn't. didn't. No, they That's didn't amazing. go ahead. They, That's they, amazing. they gave it to another school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but you know, but at least that school it was done. So yeah, yeah. I mean, but that so you can see it's not you know that there's it's not not, not just the student in, in class putting up their hand and engaging in a debate, but. Yeah, you can see it at, at, at larger levels or, or levels that kind of go out larger, you know, further and further into the community. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and as you're mentioning before, there's a lot of money and, and resources that are going into, you know, some of these larger groups like the dairy farmers and the beef farmers into like really slick, professionally designed resources that really glorify animal agriculture or, or other um, practices. And so you're, you're coming up against that as well, you know, that, that a lot of the humane washing and green washing that's going on, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, uh, Mike, I, I do wanna talk about, um, I wanna talk about, is there a role for parents who wanna try to bring more animal compassion into their kids' schools or classrooms? Like, yeah. so, you know, one thing I know about teachers is they're very, like they've got a lot on their plates. It's it's a really hard job. They're, they can get really stressed out. And sometimes when somebody delivers something on a silver platter, it's like too seductive to pass up if it's, yeah. you know, if it's like the dairy, the beef farmers of Canada have put together this amazing, you know, ready to go presentation. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we do that on our, you know, on our end of things? Yeah, like, are, are there ways yeah, that you've no, seen that happen? I, yeah, I mean, it's like parents, maybe it's, this, it's almost the same advice. That there might be parents out there who are afraid, you know, to, it's like, oh, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't. But I, I have spoken to parents who've tried things. They've tried little things. And, 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 and then all of a sudden it opens up this whole door. It's other maybe educators or other parents who maybe they were afraid to say something. And they realize like, oh my gosh, there's all these people who are interested in animal protection and, and doing more work in the school about that. But it just took one person again to kind of take that first step. And you know, there was an example at my school, um, uh, Nita Chen, who's a parent and her daughter, Isabella Huang, who's a student at my school. They started this incredible um, animal, a, a dog and cat rescue, um, and we, you know, they were they're rescuing dogs uh, mainly from China, and then they were adopting and rehoming them uh, here in the GTA, and they were kind of working completely separately. But then when I started talking about animal issues, then they came. They actually did a presentation to our entire school. They talked about the importance of adopting and not shopping. They talked about their own work. They talked about other um organizations are doing that and and that had this huge ripple effect um you know within um the the parent community um in the end our union ended up donating like 800 dollars to their organization just because we were so inspired mm -hmm. by the work they're doing so i would say you know my advice would be don't be afraid to take that first step feel it out get a temperature of the school of course but again don't feel um you know, you're never, you never know what's going to happen. And sometimes amazing things do. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, I mean, whether it's bringing in a humane educator to your, uh, you know, like uh, offering to bring in a humane educator to your child's classroom, um, or whether it is, you know, your, I, I, we, I think of uh, Nithal Jethalel, who yeah. Mike and I both know, um, and he has been an AJA uh, panelist as well. And in fact, he was on a panel with his niece, 
who had started her own Meatless Mondays campaign at her school and he'd helped out. So Uncle Nethal came and helped um, his niece get get this going at, at their school. And um, and it's become a, like a permanent thing. And now they're teaching others about it. And then that spurred on a, um, a campaign to uh, bring uh, healthy schools, uh, sorry, healthy foods into schools. Um, so it's been this really wonderful thing. So that wasn't even a parent, that was an uncle. And um, so it's like, who are the kids in your your life <laughs> and um and there and and so it's not only just about the classrooms it's about schools it's about you know maybe policies around field trips you know field trips that you know aren't don't um, condone animal cruelty it's about you know hot dog days um and having alternatives it's you know it, it's about bake sales it's everything right mike it's everything it's such a need to such a great example like yeah. such a great example it's like who are the kids in your life you know like yeah. you don't have to be a parent you could be a family friend it could be anybody so it is important it is important to have not just like the the people inside the bricks and mortar of the school like that the school community is so much bigger than that so really think about you know what is your sphere sphere of influence and for Nital, it was like well working with his niece and they could kind of help each other and support each other and have done amazing work incredible work yeah yeah, absolutely. And and every parent that comes forward to have a little meeting with the principal about, and again, friendly meeting, uh, yes. encouraging meeting, suggestions, you know, yeah. never like, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. but to be an ally and to be a great resource um, yeah. uh, also emboldens the teachers in that school to be able to do more. So, you yeah. know, there's got to be at least a, a few animal lovers in every school. Um, so it's, it's you know, when when there's a broader support from the, the community of parents, I'm, I'm sure it makes it much easier for the teachers 100 percent. And, and like my own example when i started first started speaking about this at my school so now there's there's like i found out there was like six or seven vegan teachers at my school you know that or vegetarian or were, were, were they but they they we didn't know each other we knew each other but we didn't know that aspect of each other yeah. and it just took and then somebody else started speaking about something so that you do you realize there's all these people who are are kind of like oh you know this doesn't belong in the school or this is a lifestyle thing. It's like, no, it's much bigger than that. And then one person kind of starts that off. And then, it, and then you realize there's all these other people who, who have similar values and are trying to do similar work. But, you know, when the, the classroom door closes, you don't know what's going on. So it's helpful to kind of bring that out in the open and share ideas. And, you know, there's so much strength in community. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. and that really does hit home, folks. What whatever community or whatever area you are in, um, community wise, um, that is an opportunity to create uh, animal advocacy or vegan community within that that place. Like every time, like Mike, you saw how much it helped with AJA, and then we yeah. saw how much it helps with the conference, and then we saw how Adriana Bachman saw when she created a, a corporate vegan leaders group. How it brought all of these people out of the woodwork. I mean, creating communities in all these different areas of our society, that's how people, you know, get stronger. They have courage to really live in their convictions. Right. Um, and, and that's how the ripple effects happen. So I, I love that. I love that, Mike. Um, I'm just going to read this from Sharon. She said, I was so worried as a student teacher starting a justice committee for students on human rights, environmental justice, and animal activism. Um, the first student who came in um, was from the Indigenous community near the school. They came in for the animal activism and pushed me to put together a vegan bake sampler. Um, no sale, this student said, and everyone was coming up taking pamphlets and no pushback. So, um, and, and speaking of pushback, Khalil was saying um, I, so that he, they still don't quite understand what the pushback is. Um, and, and so the kind of pushback we're talking about, Khalil, is um, parents, you know, say that uh, come from a farm community saying right. you're, you're turning our children against us or um, my, my kid, I'm afraid my kid's not going to eat meat now. And you're, you know, these kids are too young to be brainwashing them. Am, am I on the right track, Mike? Yeah, and it, it like, you, you know, um, you, you shouldn't be imposing your values as a teacher. Exactly. And it's like, I think as a teacher, we're always imposing our values to somebody. <laughs> like if you're talking about climate change, you know, you're, yeah. you, you, you're, you're talking about environmental. So it's just, well, what values are actually acceptable by society or not? So, yeah. so that is, that's, that's the, an interesting, uh, but, but yeah, those are the types of things um, um, for sure. Uh, yeah, and yeah. 
Mm. So, um, so let's talk about strategy a little bit. Um, with the uh, Educators for Animals conference, what are you most trying to achieve? Is it, you know, is it spreading strategies? Is it connecting community? Is it inspiring and, and, and empowering um, uh, educators or all of the above? Kind all of, of the above, yeah. yeah. All of the above, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, you know, from last year's conference, um, was, there, um, was there anything that really came clear to you that this is a, a special need for educators out there? Yeah, I think I think uh, one of the things that came out was number one. I had to do it again because it because it it just yeah. more and more people were saying you know I want then the, the the feedback from the conference was like we we have to do this again. These are the ways that to improve it. Um, but but another takeaway was um, really reaching further out uh, just outside of Canada and the U.S. So there was there was a number of people who are attending globally, and um, they had their own specific kind of contacts and situations in schools around the world. And so we're getting there. It still tends to be very focused on Canada and the US, but we do have our first like international speakers this year. We have a couple of sessions um, that are outside of Canada and the US. Um, we have more and more people registering from other countries. So I think as we move forward with this movement and with this conference, we're gonna see more and more like a global approach as opposed to just being so Canada and US focused. And a lot of the ideas that we're talking about can be applied, but again, have to be work within whatever cultural country context that you're working in. Yeah. Amazing. I'm trying to think now, we just had somebody join AJ that runs a vegan school and I think it's Nigeria. Okay. Um, I don't know if, he, if you've had uh, any contact with them, um, but I'm gonna hook, I'm, I'm gonna yeah, give them the, the conference um, website because I think this would be amazing for, for them. Um, and so Mike, uh, someone is asking if you have reached out to teachers in schools groups to encourage them to attend this conference, like the iste.org group, um, whether how much like the out outreach is actually happening to get people at this conference or is it more a, a word of mouth thing? Yeah, so I, that's a great, I, I should, uh, it's a good reminder to reach out to ISTE. That's like a, a huge educational organization in the go. U.S. That, yeah. Um, Perfect. But, but to be honest, we, I really rely on other people like folks on this call to, mm -hmm. to spread the word. Um, I don't know if Kirsten's had a chance to share our socials yet or on our website, you can reach all of our socials. Please follow us, mm -hmm. um, amplify our message um th this is there's no paid staff for this conference um it's myself and then there's a few other people who are helping out um and then all the people who are volunteering their time to share their expertise but we we really need that that the the community including you folks to help spread that message to ISTE spread that message to to you know the science teachers association of Ontario to you name it if you know a teacher please share this with them if you know an organization share it with them if you know a uh, subject association, please share that with them. It would really help us out a lot. We we have been doing, we do have socials that are active and we have a, a subscriber base of almost 800 folks now, educators all over the place. But we really do rely on the power numbers and power of community to help get the message out there. Mm. Yeah, Mike, I, I, I real I remembered that I, I just remember because I was searching something around around this and, and you in the posts and, um, and I saw that we did um, that as a, as an action last year, yeah. an AJA action. So uh, may, maybe we'll do that in mid July just to do a last sort of month push to get get to AJA or to share it with any, any um, educators that they know. It was a huge so, help last year. You can okay. see, I mean, I can just, you, you, I remember you putting out a push and then I wake up the next morning and there's like 50 more people have signed up at the <laughs> that's conference. Good. That's it good. Works. Okay. It works. Yeah. It works. Okay. Yeah. We will do that. We will absolutely yeah. do that. But everybody yeah. here on this call, please think of one, you know, yeah. at least one person in your life um, that is involved in education or is a really active parent um, that is, uh, you know, dedicated to or interested in animal advocacy and pass on the conference link to them. Plus, it's free right Mike is it still free it's 100 free so we're sponsored by Humane Canada amazing um, they cover all the costs um, they really were adamant that they wanted to make it free yeah. it's open when I see educators I mean that in the broadest sense of the word in terms of people even if you're not technically an educator just come 
I'm sure everybody can get something from it, but you know, that could be people who are working for organizations that work in schools or um, you know, whether you're working directly in a school or at a university doing research or it's, it's a very broad, when you check out the conference agenda and all the, the session descriptions, you see it's, it's the broadest definition of educator, the broadest definition of education that I think you can find. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And um, yeah, just so many good discussions, even as, as just an activist in general, um, yes. so many neat ideas. Uh, and, and just from this particular hour, I think folks can see how many crossovers there are in all forms of, you know, animal advocacy um, that we can glean from from each other. Um, there, I, I, I have we have time for one more question. And that is um, from um, Oh, shoot, just a second, I lost it. Tracy asked, hi, Mike, can you address ways animal issues can be incorporated into history classes? Now, Mike, you might not have this off the top of your head, but just in case that there might be a history teacher that you know of that's done something in the past um, or something that you can riff on that you've done before, just thought I'd throw that at you. Yeah, I'm not a history teacher myself, but I do know, mm -hmm. I know a history teacher for, this This is just the, what came up first, but I know a history teacher who, um, was teaching high school Canadian history and did a whole lesson on the role of um, and the service of animals in the wars, the great wars, for example. So, you know, or the exploitation, of animals, you know, just incorporating that into the discussion that usually isn't included in history. It's the war or the role of animals in these various big historical events, you know, like wars, for example. But, mm -hmm. um, I, I, nothing else comes to mind, right? So if there's any history teachers out there. Um, well, I'm not a, right. I'm not a history yeah. teacher, but um, I, I think, you know, one thing that just popped into my brain was um, I often hear people, and I just heard it last night from somebody at an event that said, can you imagine people in the future looking back at this, you know, era in history and, we'll, and what they would say about us and, and eating animals and, and the way we treat yeah. animals. And I just think it's in, it might be an interesting comparison of, of how somebody 100 years in the future might look at us compared yeah. to what we look at 100 years ago and how messed up we thought a lot of, you know, now that we think a lot of behaviors were then. So um, yeah, anyway, just throwing it out there. But I'm sure there will be many answers for you, Tracy, yeah. at the conference. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you'll yeah. get tons of ideas there absolutely yeah. um and i'm just going to address one more thing um mitat said i'm a york u uh, student being active is the priority here if you could share uh, with me some bullet points of how i'd greatly appreciate it now mitat i don't know if you're talking about with it um being an educator so i i'm just going to suggest that if you haven't joined the animal justice academy you do yeah. animaljusticeacademy.com it gives you everything you'd ever need to know about animal advocacy but also if at york university they I mean, I, I would imagine, and, and actually Eleanor could probably um, might even know about this. I would imagine most big campuses have a vegan uh, students organization um, that you could get involved with. So I know that we don't, I mean, we don't, uh, we also have uh, animal justice groups all over, but not at URQ, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't to, think there's what, a law program yeah, there. Another thing, yeah. that I don't know what it is, but there's something going on at York University, because I think a, three of our sessions are being run by either PhD students or professor, Dr. Lisa Fawcett, for example, is going to be presenting Melvin Chen, who's a PhD student, Jasmine Ferreira is big. So there, you know, again, come to the conference and check out some of those sessions from the folks at York University. It seems like there's some amazing stuff going on there. Hmm. Yeah. And we've got Ryan, who's very upset about the lobsters and crabs being uh, boiled alive. So are we, Ryan. This isn't uh, the uh, topic today, but I will just address the fact that um, there are no protections in Canada for that. And what I would suggest is that you uh, write to your MP um, and, and say this is an area of concern um, and, you know, and that this isn't, uh, there's no protection for lobsters or crabs being boiled alive. There are many initiatives in other countries happening around this, Ryan, so it's really promising. And this is actually a place where there could be some movement. So um, maybe do a little bit of research, see what the initiatives are so far, and, and follow their lead with, um, with lobbying your own MP, uh, your own MP, your own M MLA, even your own city councillor. So um, I'll, I just wanted to give that to you because I, I can see that you're, you're, you're very upset about that. Oh, and Kirsten, which we all are, and Kirsten said she sent you some resources as well. So that's great. Thank you, Ryan, for caring so much about these beings. 
Um, all right, folks, um, if you haven't been convinced already um, to, uh, you know, again, the power of, of being able to, um, you know, affect societal change uh, on an education level, um, I hope you will get to this, uh, uh, the conference and, and really see what's happening and what's possible. Um, Barry said, what the future thinks of eating animals. Star Trek Discovery has an episode called The Trouble with Edward, where the crew castigates a crew member that suggests um, he uh, suggests triples be used as a protein source. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this has already been done. Okay. And yes, SF says, Ryan, Switzerland has banned live boiling. So check out what Switzerland's done. Let's make it happen. You can lead, lead the, the campaign yourself, Ryan. We're looking for somebody to do that. Um, all right, uh, Mike, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for doing this incredibly important work. Um, you are just uh, well, I love you. You know, I love you, Anantita. Um, you're so wonderful. And, uh, and uh, this, I just, I, I so deeply believe that this is one of the most important things we can do in animal advocacy is to reach the young folks who are ready to change, who are, are ready to not even go down the road of animal cruelty. Um, so lots of thank yous in there. And Tim says, my sister is a teacher in BC and vegetarian. I'm going to be calling her tonight to pass along all the ideas shared here oh, and to get her be to be part of the conference um, and I hope everyone will do this for Mike and for this conference and for this issue um, to reach out as soon as you're done to a teacher or an educator you know. All right folks um, let's go back to uh, gallery view Kirsten um, and as you're doing as we're doing that I just want to say um, our next lunchtime live is Thursday July 14th with Leila Kassam from the Animal Think Tank in the UK. Um, if you're not already on our email list to get notices of that, make sure you write, uh, sign up for free at animaljusticeacademy.com. Um, it's been wonderful to see all of you here live and especially for a second event this week. Mike, let's give Mike a big AJ. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mike. And good luck. Let's, 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 let's put the building blocks into place to change the world here, okay? Thanks so much, everyone. Kimberly, thank you. For the, this, okay. is, this is amazing. Okay, thank you everyone. Talk to you soon. Have a wonderful long weekend, everyone. Bye.